Thanks, Colleen. Uh, thanks for everybody that came out tonight. It's so cold. Uh, I see a lot of familiar faces, but a lot of new faces. And thank you, like Colleen said, to the gentlemen that came to join us tonight. Uh, this must be a very um, popular topic of interest. So um, I've got uh, uh, some high level um, insight for you about our journey um, from on-prem to in the cloud. Um, and then my team is always very willing to meet one-on-one -on -one and do technical deep dives with anybody that wants to learn more. So, um, because there's a lot of technology that goes in behind all of this. So, um, as Colleen mentioned, I'm Robin Messerly, Director of IT here at Nebraska Furniture Mart. Uh, this wonderful building, we've actually been in here for six years now. Um, I think it was a telemarketing group at one point uh, that, that uh, was housed in here. And then the building sat empty for three years. Um, and it got bat infested and mold and, and uh, when we opened up our Texas store, we had to add to our home office staff um, and then we were bursting at the seams. So we bought this building and completely renovated it and uh, we love the space. So it's nice to uh, be able to host events like this here. Um, so we are gonna start with a little bit of history of NFM, but I have a couple of fabulous prizes to give out with some trivia questions for you. So shout out, uh, maybe raise your hand uh, too in unison so I can see who's first um, to answer. Who knows who our founder is? Mrs. Blumpkin. Mrs. Blumpkin, yes, Rose Blumpkin. So thank oh. you. Thank you for just asking in general. No, thank you me. get a prize, a fabulous prize. Uh, so that's, um, I can't remember, but it was, um, I think it's a t-shirt from one of our um, generous sponsors that we had some leftover stuff from our uh, holiday jingle, not jingle mingle. Carpet. What? It's not new carpet. It's not new carpet, no. <laughs> and an ice yes, and an ice scraper, which comes in handy this time of year. Uh, my next trivia question is, does anybody know what year our company was founded? Yes, wow. Good for you. Did you used to work here? <laughs> yes, 1937. <laughs> there you go. Thank you. Yeah, so we'll, we'll just dive into a little bit of history of the Mart. We were founded in 1937 by Rose Blumpkin. I think she's endearingly known as Mrs. B. Um, and, and her clearance center on the north end of our campus is still called Mrs. B's Clearance Center. Uh, she was a, a little Russian immigrant that spoke very broken English, um, but she was smart as a whip, did math in her head, and never forgot anything. Um, she was so kind to her customers and was thrilled about getting them a good deal. Her um, motto was sell cheap and tell the truth, and she never took no for an answer. And she started this little furniture business in the basement of her husband's pawn shop downtown in um, Omaha in 1937 and then uh, you know this is what it's become. She worked till she was 103 years old and um, passed away just shortly after that. And did anybody get an opportunity to shop with Mrs. Mrs. B? Yeah I see some hands. I did too before I worked here obviously. But she buzzed around in her cart and she just you know she was our best salesperson. Um, her grandsons uh, are Irv and Ron Blumpkin, and uh, they're both still very much a part of our um, executive team. Irv is the CEO, and uh, Ron is now chairman of board. Uh, we just uh, moved a new person into the president, the C uh, chief operating officer role, um, about a year and a half ago, Tony Bolt. So, uh, but then they've got some children that are also very actively involved um, in the business. So. We like to surround ourselves with uh, the Blumkin family. Um, her, let's see, she sold, do I have that? I do. Uh, she did sell 85% um, of Nebraska Furniture Mart to Warren Buffett in 1983 on a handshake. And I kid you not, I've seen the contract. It's a one page, one sided contract um, that they struck this deal. So, um, and Warren still talks very fondly about uh, Mrs. Blumkin and this being one of his, you know, his top five businesses that he owns. So we're proud of that. It's good to be part of, um, you know, Warren Buffett's crew. 
Um, in 2003, we opened up our Kansas City store, so it's about the same amount of retail space as we have here on our Omaha campus, but it's one building, two stories. It's a beautiful store. If you're ever in um, Kansas City, I encourage you to go visit it. About the same product line. Um, we started our first e-commerce website in 2006. Uh, we, this was kind of a slow process for us. We were a little bit late to the game. Uh, when I started here in 2001, one of the first things I tried to convince Ron and Herb Blumpkin was that we needed an e-commerce site. And they're like, we're brick and mortar. We don't need to sell on the internet. Um, and so we at least convinced them to have a marketing site to kind of talk about our brick and mortar stores. And then we gradually got to putting our product catalog out there and then showing our prices. And in 2006, eventually, we, we did have an e-commerce site. So. And that's been very, very successful. It's now um, about 9% of our overall revenues. So it continues to be a driver of traffic to the store, our best marketing um, you know, media. And um, it's a great way for people to shop our store before they drive in, you know, because we are kind of a destination. Um, in 2015, we opened our Dallas store, which is, has anybody been to our Dallas store? Yeah, a few of you. Is it beautiful or? Yes, it is dynamite. So it's kind of our flagship store. Um, it's about 600,000 retail, um, 600,000 square feet of retail space. And then um, with the distribution center, it's about 1.3 million square feet of space. Uh, when we went into that community, we bought 435 acres. So this is the first time we've really become real estate agents. So we own the land around us. We're a flagship store, or one of the anchor stores. Shields is building their flagship store there, and it opens in April of 2020. Um, and then we lease the, the real estate to tenants. So it's mixed use, so you know, there's indoor carting, and there's a movie theater, and lots of entertainment, and um, you know, food venues, and a truck yard, and all sorts of great things. It's, it's beautiful, I encourage you to stop by and uh, spend a day there because there's a lot to see. Um, so we continue to work on our Grandscape development. That's the name of the acres around our store. Uh, it's about a 10-year build. We're about two years into it. So we, we grand opened the main section in March of this year. So we're excited about that. Um, we are the largest home furnishing store in North America. Uh, there's really nobody in uh, North America that can compete with our business model and the categories that we're in all under one store. Uh, we do about $1.8 billion in revenue in, in our three major stores, so that's, that's a lot of sales in three stores. Um, and we have about 5,000 employees, with about 1,400 here in Omaha. So that is a little bit about us. So our journey started uh, with a project, basically. Um, and I think everybody's journey starts a little bit different, but um, ours started with a need to rewrite our website. So it had been um, about four years since we, re since we deployed our website, and so we needed to uh, give it a facelift, re-architect it, so we decided we're gonna go all in on this. Uh, we rewrote every line of code for our e-commerce site, every line, um, and we re-architected. Uh, we were hosted in uh, as infrastructure as a service, um, so we um, architected our code to be able to be in the public cloud. We chose Azure uh, because we're a very heavy Microsoft shop, but we also architected it so that it could be moved to another public cloud like AWS or Google. Uh, with relatively few um, enhancements, big architectural changes. Um, so we had multiple code bases with our old um, e-commerce platform. We had a code base for our salespeople that have tablets in the store. That was one code base we maintained. We maintained a code base for desktop and tablet, and then another code base for mobile, uh, for phone apps. Um, so it was difficult, um, as you might imagine, to make changes across all three code bases. It was also a monolithic code base, which means it was all tightly ingrained. So uh, we moved to microservices, so there's little chunks of code. Uh, but when it's all monolithic, you have to test everything. Like if you make one change to the shopping cart, for example, you have to, you have to test the entire code base from beginning to end. Um, our testing practices were manual. 
Um, so you might imagine that testing a small change took a very long time. So as a result, we were able to uh, deploy code to production every two weeks, typically. Um, and sometimes if we got lucky, it was every one week. Um, so we had, uh, as I mentioned, all manual test practices. So our QAs were very busy just, you know, developing scenarios and testing things to the best of their ability with no automation. Our developers also didn't write unit tests. And uh, quite honestly, I don't think I have any of them in here. They didn't think they needed to. <laughs> they, thought, they thought that's the tester's uh, problem. Um, so in our page load time on our website was um, on average five to um, eight seconds. So we knew we needed to make a big change. So we, we jumped in head first. Um, like I said, we rewrote the entire code base. Um, so we used microservices implemented in Docker um, and using DCOS on Azure supported by, we created a CI CD pipeline and implemented a DevOps practice. Uh, we use VAMP and test architect. Um, and now we have one code base. So it's a code base that's responsive across all of those form factors that we talked about. And then we moved from infrastructure as a service hosted in somebody else's data center to um, into the cloud. And I will say that's been a bit challenging because we had a lot of control over things like downtime or latency. And when you move into the public cloud, you're a little bit you know, a hand tied with that. Uh, Microsoft has been super responsive for us, but you feel a little bit, um, you know, a little, you have a little less control and that's a little bit unnerving. But uh, fortunately, there's not much downtime. So since then, so we implemented the website in September of 2008 with the new architecture. Um, but we've also created uh, through that process, we created an enablement team, and those are the team, the teammates that are responsible for the automation. So that's our DevOps engineers, it's our there's a software architect, it's our automated test engineers, it's our beloved scrum master who's up there watching uh, from the wings, <laughs> uh, Lisa Miller. She she kind of she manages that team quite well, and they and they have a manager, and and we've got some senior developers and technical leads on that team. So. Uh, that team kind of started out of um, necessity for what we were doing with the website, but now they've become this enterprise enablement team where they're, they've worked with our BI team to get them into the pipeline for automated deployment as well. Um, and they're working with our ServiceNow team to get them into the pipeline. So uh, we're really using their, their talent and their expertise um, across the entire enterprise now. Uh, we created a cloud center of excellence, and I'm going to dive into more detail on that um, in, a, in a few slides from now. So, um, and then our developers now, much to their chagrin, initially write unit tests, but um, it's, been, it's been really successful and good for them because they, you know, they have to think a little bit about you know, ripple of, of what they're doing. And um, if, they don't, if something gets passed to QA without a unit test, they kindly get sent back. So um, that's, been, that's been good. And then we have automated test scripts. So we've got, you know, kind of your, your typical examples of an e-commerce site, like put something in a shopping cart or check out or um, enter my account information, that kind of stuff. We have automated test scripts for that. But then we also have over 60 um, automated regression tests that run nightly and alert us if something fails. Um, so you can't, a developer can't check in code and um, have it, uh, it, it has to pass tests before it can get, go any further in the pipeline. Um, we now deploy upwards of 20 times a day if there's a need. Um, and we've also moved into a software defined network. And I don't know, it's, it's going to be a journey, but um, we're trying to, we're used to have, you didn't couple network and server and storage together, you know, a software defined network allows you uh, to be able to do that. And then you can be much more nimble like you are in a public cloud. And so we've, we've implemented things like Cisco ACI, so their software defined data center, uh, their Hyperflex, Cisco's Hyperflex. We've also implemented Mist Wireless, their cloud um, controllerless um, wireless uh, that has AI and machine learning. So that's been really successful too. And they're much easier to manage than your traditional um, controllers. 
Uh, and then we also have fully automated processes for spinning up virtual machines in our private cloud. Um, so that's about soft. I, I could talk about software networking for a while, but I, I won't. Um, so our enablement team also since then, they've, they've instrumented a lot of mar uh, monitoring and alerting. So they use Sysdig to respond to issues before our customers can be impacted by them. So for example, they receive alerts when production resources exceed a certain threshold. Our threshold is 80%. Um, they also use Uptime Robot to detect when the, so the site is unhealthy um, and they start working the issue before customers um, you know, get affected. So I'm going to just open it up to questions real quick. Any questions on what we've talked about so far? Yes? Um, we, Azure seemed to be the path of least resistance for us, quite honestly, because we're, very, we're a very heavy Microsoft shop. Uh, we have strong relationships with Microsoft, and um, you know, it's just technology we were familiar with. Uh, we did evaluate AWS. What's that? Oh, we did a study. Yep. And we also do have uh, a few things in the AWS cloud. And we've, we're, we just started leveraging a bit of uh, the Google cloud um, for some of our Adobe stuff, I think. So you, we try to remain cloud agnostic, but just Azure was, um, I think, the path of least resistance for us. How many databases did we migrate? Um, so e-commerce, I would say, hmm, I don't know, five or six maybe databases. They're all SQL. Yes? That's an excellent technical question that I don't have the answer to. <laughs> but we can definitely take it offline. And like I said, um, my technical team is happy to meet with anybody that wants to learn more after this. So um, I'm not sure. Lisa, you don't know, do you? I don't. OK. <laughs> good question. Yeah, very good question. We needed Michael Nicholson. Yeah, we needed our software architect that arch architected it that way for us. Um, okay, so our focus has changed too um, since 2017. So we used to be a build everything in house shop, and we are moving to a buy best and breed solutions um, and integrate them with, with our um, systems that we have. Um, so, for example, over the last two years, we implemented six modules from JDA. Um, and they are in the upper right hand quadrant, uh, you know, the magic quadrant. Um, for supply chain, so it's we basically ripped and replaced all of our supply chain with JDA. Um, Salesforce, we are in the process of implementing Service Cloud and Commerce Cloud. Service Cloud is set to go live um, at the end of February, and Commerce Cloud in June. Um, Enterworks is they have multiple products, but we are going to use them for master data management. And for um, PIM, which is a product information manager, so right now most of our, um, our catalog information gets entered manually by people or through spreadsheets that uh, people send us. So, so the PIM will allow us to have a lot more data integrity um, and automated processes for vendor to get information into our system. Um, and then we implemented Adobe for marketing, so four of their products, uh, we implemented those over the last six months. So as you can see, we're implementing a lot of SaaS uh, solutions and um, really trying to rely less on, it's hard to stay ahead of the competition when you're, um, you know, you're trying to do it all yourself because the industry changes so rapidly. Question? You said that you implemented this for your web base, your website. Mm -hmm. Is that, is, is the plan to have the website 
transactions be about the same as the in-person transactions, or is it just so that you have a better website to present to the customer? So the question is, did we implement the website and the re-architecture and the updated technology because we want to expand it across the organization? Um, it was, it, we have actually expanded a lot of what we've done there. So the microservice layer that we built, we use that for a lot of other applications and we will continue to. Um, and we've moved to very API centric um, through that process kind of kickstarting us along the way. Um, but we are actually now replacing that website that we implemented uh, last September with Salesforce Commerce Cloud. So anybody that is, you know, in the e-commerce business, you know it changes rapidly. So you have to be, as soon as you release, you have to figure out what you're going to do for the next release. So we evaluated um, continuing to do it in-house or buy a product. And we evaluated many different products and we ended up with um, Salesforce Commerce Cloud. So. Are you expecting that from a revenue perspective that that could end up being as much revenue for the company as the retail locations? Or? Yeah, so um, as far as revenue expectations for the web, we know that that is going to be the fastest growing. It has this year was, uh, our projection was to grow that, uh, our e-commerce business by 16% and it grew 26%. So we know that that trend is going to continue. Again, it's 9% of our overall revenues. So I think our brick and mortar stores, we're also very focused on how to drive more traffic to the stores and create, um, you know, we kind of want to be the Disneyland of, of experience. So I was just in my executive meeting today and, and we talked a lot about how to, how to uh, offer additional services that we don't, um, have today and additional categories. So we really want, uh, while we're destination location, we do plan to organically grow our brick and mortar store. Uh, but I, I can see e-commerce, it's hard to say where that's going to, to end because right now our, the new generation, Gen Z, and that they like going to your brick and mortar stores where uh, you know the previous generation, not so much. Um, so it's uh, the millennials don't talk to me and um, you know and and I want to do everything self-serve and I mean there's nothing wrong with it but but that's how they were but now we're seeing that the the Gen Z they want they want to be in they want to have conversation and they want to be in your stores so hard to say really but we're we're preparing for you know the load to be significant good question um, so as I mentioned, that highlighted the need for us to change our, our overall technology foundation. So our ERP system is a legacy system, and um, it's a mainframe system with um, a technology that is not widely used. It's a PIC database, so, and PIC basic is the, is the programming language. So um, we know that it has taken us longer to develop because of that um, ERP system and it being the single source of truth, the single source of data, single source of business logic. So everything we've built around it, we've really built as just kind of a, a lens into that single source. It does, does all of the business logic, it sends all of the data. So we're moving away from that, um, and I could talk about this for a whole nother session, but we have an integration hub project that we're working on where we're gonna bring the data up to a later layer that is accessible by all of the platforms um, around it and then start bringing the business logic up out of that ERP system too. So that's another big, big strategy. Okay, so uh, Cloud Center of Excellence. Uh, I wanna talk about this. Uh, we engaged with uh, local, yes? Well, we've um, engaged with uh, local, well, not really local, they're, they're kind of world, worldwide, but Capgemini, so Jetty is the local group here that we're working with. Um, so we're doing it in tandem with them. Some of our resources are working on it and then um, some of theirs. And we will be implementing MVP for, for that, um, so the overall architecture, and then including the customer data specifically in June of this year. And then we have a long ways to go after that. Um, so we engaged with Jellicoe, a local partner of ours, um, about a year and a half ago, and we asked them to perform a readiness assessment. 
you know, how ready are we um, to go to the cloud? Uh, so they did that, and one of the things that came out of that was a recommendation to form a cloud center of excellence, which we did. So this is a cross-functional team. Uh, we have infrastructure, app dev, DevOps, operations, security, some of our solution architects from the different um, disciplines. And um, their responsibilities um, initially were uh, talking about governance, how are we gonna govern who does what in the cloud, and what are our standards? So how, how does a developer, for example, go and spin up um, a virtual machine in the cloud? What does that look like? What are the standards? Um, what's the security? And then enablement and adoption. So make it easy for people to understand how to leverage the cloud and to kind of become cheerleaders or advocates for it um, and get the word out. So here's some of the activities that they do. Um, so we talked about the standards. So that's for coding, that's for architecture, that's for security. That's across the board. What does it look like um, to, go, to be in the cloud? Um, so I'll let you read through some of that. Uh, you know, managing our maturity model, setting the business architecture strategy, um, talking about staff skills and staff training. So who's going to be impacted next by a cloud, um, cloud instance and what additional training do they need? Our infrastructure group, for example, um, you know, you had, we had a lot of server and storage people. Their jobs have changed dramatically and they're becoming cloud engineers and so they've had to reskill and um, learn some new technology. Um, and then evangelize uh, the cloud value and, and connecting all of these clouds to get a 360 degree view of everything that we're doing at NFM, everything that our customers are doing on these various platforms. Uh, so they have a big job. Uh, and this is some of their accomplishments, and I'm not going to read this slide to you, but um, uh, Lisa actually, she facilitates this, this group um, on a weekly basis. They meet every Tuesday, and one of the things they do is we have an intake review process where everybody in the organization submits their, um, their requests or their enhancements or their ideas through this intake review process. Uh, to come to IT, and so they review anything new from the previous week and see if there's a cloud component to it. And if there is, then they get involved. Um, and they also look at things like what contracts are coming up for renewal and is there an opportunity to use a, a, a SaaS solution. A really good example of that is uh, we use JD Edwards for our financials, and um, we just, with our most recent upgrade, they finally had a SaaS solution that met our needs. Their early ones uh, didn't, um, so we took advantage of that. Um, and so they also have uh, spreadsheets that they, that they use for projecting costs and ROI. Does it make sense to move this um, application to the cloud or this database to the cloud or this payload to the cloud? Um, so they have a big job and they have done a remarkable job. I gave them um, some objectives for the first year and they, they killed them right out of the gate and they're doing every, you know. And now they've got a really nice cadence and um, they're working really well together. So I guess I didn't really call out the fact that we have a hybrid cloud, but we do. So we use um, the public cloud, the private cloud, and you know, traditional infrastructure. So our ERP system is, again, it's a homegrown system, it's traditional infrastructure in a data center in Papillion. Um, but then we also have our private cloud, and uh, for anybody that doesn't know what that is, it's really your assets, you know, your network, your server, your storage, your assets that sit behind your own firewall, um, but you've also made them um, be able to coexist on one piece of um, equipment to make it easy to leverage, or leverage some of the same capabilities you have in the public cloud to spin up instances of, of servers and databases very quickly, but on, on behind your own firewalls. Um, so the primary advantage of being um, a hybrid solution is really agility, because if, if you're playing in all three of the, those worlds and, and something comes up, it makes it pretty easy to know where it should live and, and you don't have to you know, jump through a bunch of hoops to figure out which environment is the best. So uh, we really encourage, and I, and I think through the work we've done with a lot of um, other companies and people I've collaborated with, hybrid cloud seems to work really well for people. 
Um, so some of the advantages are scalability um, in the public cloud. Um, so yeah, so this is public cloud specifically. So scalability, it's very easy to ramp up and ramp down quickly. So we did that over the holidays. We, um, it's a very, very busy shopping season for us. So we scaled up our Azure um, uh, instances and then we scaled down um, after the holidays. Um, lower capital expense because you don't have that upfront cost of buying the traditional hardware and storage. Uh, so you don't, have, you don't have that initial capex. Um, reliability, um, you know, not everybody's infrastructure is as reliable as the cloud is. You know, they, they pretty much have to guarantee four nines. Um, and, you know, from what we've seen, our, our SLA has been um, intact. So it's been, it's been really good. And we had, our website had 99.98% uptime last year. So we were uh, very happy with that. Uh, disadvantages, so you have less control over the, you know, data security. So our data can live um, in multiple data centers in the Azure space, um, and you, so you don't, you kind of lose a little bit of control. And, um, you know, some people say that the cloud is more secure, and some people say it's not. So I guess it's it's up for debate. I, I feel like it's secure, but uh, we do keep our financial data behind um, in our own um, uh, private network. Um, higher operational expenditure. So while um, you have a lower capex getting into the public cloud, you could spend more in the public cloud, and um, you know there's ways to control that for sure. And we've instrumented a lot of um, solutions to alert us if something caps or to you know something's running out of control. We also do things like spin down our dev environments over um, you know non-work times, and, and there's way to uh, ways to manage it. But I have talked to a lot of people that said their costs, they thought they were going to save money, and they ended up skyrocketing. So you just, there's ways to manage it, but you have to be very careful. Um, and then I will have to say uh, it's been difficult to find talent, um, which I think there's just an overall technical talent shortage. But to find people with experience, um, like DevOps or cloud experience, it's, it's been tough. So I don't know if anybody else has had that experience. Yeah, I see some heads nodding. Definitely. Um, so some advantages to the private cloud. Um, security, obviously you have more control when it's behind your firework, or fireworks, uh, your firewalls. Um, potentially lower t total cost of ownership, potentially. Again, um, you have uh, a little bit more initial investment, but maybe lower cost keeping it um, on-prem. Uh, greater control and customization. Uh, flexibility to, uh, if you want to burst into the public cloud, it's, it's easier to do it if, if you've got things virtualized in your own private network. Disadvantages, some people would say higher costs. Um, you know, it's kind of, I pulled these from the internet, so, um, you know, it's a little bit higher costs or lower costs. I think it could be either, depending on how you manage it. Um, responsibility, so it takes more people, right? And one of the things that we've loved about uh, our SaaS applications and the public cloud is that we don't have to have all of those people that are, you know, keeping the light switches on and keeping upgrades and, you know, doing the maintenance and the patches that it's done for us. So, um, so that's been nice. Um, and then um, less flexibility was also a call out of your being in your private cloud. Okay, so here's some kind of typical scenarios for a hybrid cloud. So if you have dynamic or frequently changing workloads, sometimes it's nice to um, be able to use a hybrid. Some of that, you know, the, the stuff that doesn't change as much could live more in the public cloud and the stuff that's more secure or changes a lot could be um, in your private network. Separating critical workloads from less sensitive workloads, again, um, the less sensitive workloads could be maybe in the public cloud and the, the critical or sensitive data could be in your private cloud. Um, big data processing, it's nice to be able to do some of that heavy processing um, or storage in the cloud where it's very affordable. Um, and then also when you're in a hybrid cloud, moving to the cloud incrementally and at your own pace. Um, once you kind of have your foot in the door, it's, easy, it's much easier 
uh, to be able to figure out what, what should go and what shouldn't. Um, temporary processing capacity needs, so it's nice to be able to just spin things up and spin things down in the, in the um, public cloud. Um, and then flexibility for the future. So again, if, if you're in that hybrid environment, you're in a pretty flexible position to be able to use, um, spin up what you need. So just hybrid cloud is popular for a reason, unless you have clear cut needs that are fulfilled by only public cloud solution or a private cloud solution, why limit your options? Choose hybrid cloud um, and you can tap the advantages of both worlds. So what our architect looks, architecture looks like now, so we went from mostly homegrown systems, as I mentioned, uh, monolithic code bases, manual testing practices, no in-code unit tests, um, on-prem private clouds and infrastructure as a service, to best in breed uh, SaaS solutions and platforms, microservices, in-code unit tests, automated testing, a CI-CD pipeline, uh, software-defined networking, and a hybrid cloud architecture. So, and we've done um, all of this in the course of about three and a half years. So we've taken on a lot of change um, in our, our core technology and infrastructure, which has meant a lot of reskilling of staff, too. Uh, so recommendations on how to get started. Uh, these are just mine, but I'd love to hear from other people that have also been on a journey um, when I'm done yapping and um, see, what, see what you would recommend. Um, so I really appreciated the, the readiness assessment because we, we didn't know, um, you know how, how mature we were, if we were ready to move into the cloud. We didn't know what we didn't know. So having a third party come in and perform that unbiased assessment of your current state, um, I would strongly recommend that. And I know there's a lot of great agencies in our, our group tonight that perform those kind of services. Um, and then forming a Cloud Center of Excellence. So if it's determined that you are ready, I think that Cloud Center of Excellence has been a key to our success because otherwise people are kind of nickel and diming it along the way, if it, you know, um, but if they've got time set aside each week to focus on this, um, you're more apt to move, move the needle quicker. Um, change management is really important because when you talk about things like going to the cloud and you've got a staff of people that um, you know, manage server and storage, for example, it's scary for them. So getting out in front of that, anticipating that, uh, you know, maybe that angst and just um, letting them know that this, this doesn't mean that we're eliminating your position, but you're gonna be reskilled. So hopefully, you know, people are up for that and, and willing to take, learn some new skills and um, move into some new technology areas. Um, <clears throat> Country Thunder. <laughs> uh, uh, don't, don't try to lift and shift everything. So I think the, the horror stories I've heard about um, moving to the cloud are the people that tried to just literally lift and shift everything to the cloud and they ended up spending a fortune because they didn't, they didn't re-architect their solutions to use the power of the services that live in the cloud. Um, and you know, that I just, I don't encourage lift and shift, especially not everything. There might be some things that you can lift and shift, but I think it takes a careful architectural uh, look. Um, watch your consumption closely. So be very aware, get the tools that you need to um, alert you when things uh, start getting out of control and, and be creative on ways that you can save money too. I mean, like I said, that we spin down our, our dev environment when we don't need it and, um, we spin down our production resources when it's a slower time of year, that type of stuff. So there's ways to manage it effectively. Um, again, leveraging appropriate tooling to manage costs. And then think agnostic. Um, I think I don't want to get into, um, into a situation where, is anybody from Microsoft here? Where Microsoft knows that they're the only player, right? I mean, it's good to have leverage and it's good to keep your options open um, because they're, not all of the services are the same across the clouds, right? So AWS has some amazing services that we're taking advantage of in our, our BI 
um, and analytics space that Azure don't, doesn't offer. So, I mean, cost-wise, I think they're probably both about the same, um, but it's good to keep your options open. So accomplishments will prove to be a journey, not a destination. And I, and I think um, I like that quote by Eisenhower because I think we all know this is an evolution and um, you don't just get there and you stop. So we're, we're, we'll continue this journey. Um, and um, you know, I would guess that probably a year from now, we'll, our architecture again will look much different than it does today. Um, as many of us are in IT, so we know that it's a constantly changing environment. And, the tools and technology will continue to evolve as well. And I think that is what I have. So what questions do you have for me? Uh, we were hosted at F... Yes, so the question was, for infrastructure as a service, what did we use? Uh, we were hosted at uh, first uh, FNTS. Downtown. Yeah. 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 I can't answer that. See, I should have had one of my technical people here. I'm sorry. But we can definitely circle back around with you. If you have a card, I can uh, circle back around with you with a conversation on that. Yes? So you mentioned change management and rescaling. Did you also include HR with this if people were having to be moved around or you know, what was the different skills they need to have? So we had HR involved from a mostly from a corporate communication. Um, perspective so we try to be very transparent at the Mart about everything we've got going on um, so they they kind of helped with the crafting the corporate communication they are always a resource for us if we feel like we need them to come in and help council staff fortunately we've had um, pretty good adoption um, we've had a, a few people in our infrastructure group that have been pretty nervous but they've um, as soon as they started learning the new skills like scripting and, and that type of stuff, uh, they got kind of excited. So um, HR hasn't um, helped with that, but um, they do help with the change management across the enterprise for big projects that we're doing like our Salesforce projects and PIM and Enterworks. They help with the corporate communication and, and the change management um, part of those. Yes, yes. Actually, I think we have a certification course this week or next, um, Azure certification course. And yeah, they, they get a lot of training and we take advantage of their, oh, it's not Premier anymore. It changed in October. Whatever their, their um, elite kind of um, training and support program. We typically have enough that we fill up the whole class. They'll send us the link maybe a day or so in advance, and we typically will fill up a class. Okay. <laughs> because you want to attend too, Beth? Okay. Okay. Yes? Yeah. So the entire timeline um, from when we kicked it off uh, to when we implemented was about two and a half years. And we did have to maintain our current, um, or uh, our, what was our current website. Um, but what we tried to do was minimize the amount of features we added to that website. Um, there were some things we just simply had to do. And of course, break, fix things you had to do. Um, but most of our staff, we transitioned to working on the new site. And we had one, one small team that was responsible for keeping, you know, kind of keeping the lights on. Um, and then I will say, now that we are in the middle of implementing Commerce Cloud, well, we're in heavy into development right now, um, we have leveraged um, remote resources in India um, that have been great about keeping our current site that we implemented last September refreshed, 
and um, you know any brake fix and um, there we're trying not to add again a lot of new features to that uh, website but it it's still an amazing tool and it needs to run well in that so that's that's been nice being able to leverage that group yes what's the feedback from the customers have they seen a difference are you seeing an improvement in your customer satisfaction yes so the question is what's the feedback been like from our customers uh, we have a less than three second response time. I, I should have included that. Um, and so, of course, they love that. And then they speak with their wallets, right? And, and the conversion rates, our conversion rates have gone from, uh, the old site was about 1% and we're up above, well, sometimes we hit like 5% conversion, which is incredible in the e-commerce space. Um, and so they're spending more. We've grown from 7% of the revenue to 9% of the revenue with the new site. Um, and again, some of that is, is the generation, right? And they want to shop on, on the website too. Um, I will say we've also reduced our expenses on average by about $40,000 $40, a month moving from infrastructure as a service to Azure. So like the month of December, they're, the disparate, you know, the it wasn't that much, but then there have been some months where we've saved upwards of 60,000 um, from the previous year. So uh, it's been a good cost savings um, for us as well. What about yes. the chat? Are you moving to interacting with your consumers via chat? Uh, so our contact center agents use chat um, and on the website, Lisa, I don't, no, I don't, we don't um, on our website, but I think that Commerce Cloud has chat as a feature. I'm not exactly sure how that's gonna work, if our service agents will man that or not. But um, what I'm excited about is, is the notion of a chat bot mm -hmm. that can, you know, you can interact with a bot and it's almost like interacting with a human being um, until they can't answer and then it does um, get passed to a human being. So uh, that, that's part of Commerce Cloud and it's also part of um, Service Cloud. Yeah, Colleen. So is the system that you use in your stores totally separate from your e-commerce system? It, uh, there, is that it, one in the cloud too, the one that you have in your stores? It, part of it is in the cloud, so it uses the microservice layer, so all of the APIs and the communication back to our ERP system, that's all reused. Um, it uses some of the search and navigation that's on our website, which is Hawk um, Search. And, but and it, it shares the database uh, but the ui part of it 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 started out as a, a windows 10 application and um, it's actually a different code base than the website some of them are shared services like the credit app for example um, but what our salespeople need on their tablet is so much different than what the retail customer needs on a website so um, there, there's a we reuse what we can um, and then some of it is in our virtual or our private network. Yes? In retrospect, are there any decisions that you wish had been made differently and you should have done differently? Um, well, yes. Um, <laughs> there's, there's a lot of learning lessons. You know, we, when we tackled that project, um, the rewriting of the website, we tackled it as one big, this whole piece of glass was our roadmap um, for release. And I wished we would have released along the way uh, because I think we could have started getting value out of the new website much sooner than two and a half years later. You know, So um, I think it's important when you have big projects like that to figure out how to um, bite size, you know, incrementally release to start getting some value. Um, our scrum practices were not as solid as they are today, so we've recognized that through the um, through that process, and so we've you know we've certified scrum masters. Lisa you know trains scrum, um, and so that's. I wish we would have been better at scrum uh, during that process. Um, in hindsight, I wish we would have had more budget, <laughs> and I think. Uh, you know, the executive team, you know, they were, they were so taken back that it took so long, but they also didn't really want to give us more resources. So um, I think if they had it to do over again, they would have said, throw what you, 
what you need, add it, and get it done in a year. And we would have figured out how to get it done in a year. Those are the things that come to mind. Oh, yeah. So the question is, did we have any problems with our vendors when we moved from on-prem to in the cloud? Um, nothing that really comes to mind. Nothing that s sticks out in my memory as, as a big, uh -uh. no. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yep, we use that pipeline for our, our private network and um, the public cloud. And it was challenging because it was new to us, right? So, I mean, we did a lot of self-learning and um, we stubbed our toes a lot along the way, um, but we're pretty darn good at it now. Yeah. Did you have another question, Colleen? No. Oh, okay. Anybody else want to share their experience at all or advice as you've moved to the public cloud? Yes? Can you stand up? Might be able to hear you just a little bit better. Uh huh. Good. Congratulations. Do we do what? Blue green releases or canary releases, you know, where you just release to a subgroup of your customers. We don't. So the question is kind of the A, B, or blue yeah. green um, releases. Do we do those? We don't do those today, uh, but we will with our Commerce Cloud um, implementation. We'll have the ability to do that. All right. Well, thank you, Robin. Yeah, thank all of you.